Hello, I'm Sheldon Axler, the author of Linear Algebra Done Right. This video discusses part one of the section of the book titled Duality. We will focus in this video on dual bases and dual maps. The material in this section is a bit more abstract than most of the book. Thus, you may want to temporarily skip this section and come back to it later. Let's begin with a usual quick review of notation. F denotes either the scalar field R of real numbers or the scalar field C of complex numbers. V and W denote vector spaces over the same field F. Linear maps from a vector space to itself are sufficiently important that we gave them a special name, operators. Now we deal with another class of special linear maps, and we also give them a special name. Specifically, a linear functional on our vector space V is a linear map from V to the scalar field F. In other words, a linear functional is an element of the vector space of linear maps from V to F. Let's look at some examples of linear functionals. Our first example is a linear functional phi from R3 to R. It's defined by phi of x comma y comma z equals 4x minus 5y plus 2z. The reason we call this a linear functional is that we're mapping into the scalar field R. Our second example is on Cn. Fix a vector b1 up to bn in Cn and define phi from Cn to C by phi of z1 up to zn is equal to b1z1 plus etc up to plus bnzn. Then phi is a linear functional on Cn. Again, we are mapping in this case into the scalar field C. For our third example, define a linear functional phi on the vector space of polynomials with real coefficients by phi of polynomial p is 3 times the second derivative of p at 5 plus 7 times p evaluated at 4. Then p is a linear functional on the vector space of polynomials with real coefficients. Again, we call it a linear functional because we are mapping into the scalar field R. For our final example, define phi again on the vector space of polynomials with real coefficients by phi of p equaling the integral from 0 to 1 of p. Phi again is a linear functional on our vector space. Again, it is mapping into the scalar field R. We gave the vector space of operators from V to V a special notation. In particular, we let L of V comma V equal L of V. We did this because L of V is so important. Similarly, the vector space of linear functionals is so important that we give it a special name and a special notation. In particular, the dual space of V denoted by V prime is the vector space of all linear functionals on V. In other words, V prime is equal to L of V comma F. Now we have an important theorem. It says, suppose V is finite dimensional, then the dual space V prime is also finite dimensional and it has the same dimension as V. Let's look at the proof of this dimensionality. V prime equals L of V comma F. Thus the dimension of V prime is the dimension of L of V comma F. And we proved previously a result about the dimension of the vector space of linear maps from one vector space to another. That dimension is the dimension of the first vector space times the dimension of the second vector space. In this case, our second vector space is F, the scalar field, and it has dimension 1. So we get the desired result, as shown here. Each basis of V is associated with a basis of the dual space V prime. This basis is called the dual basis of the original basis. Let's see how to define it. Suppose we have a basis v1 up to vn of v. The dual basis is the list v sub 1 up to v sub n of elements of v prime, where each v sub j is a linear functional on v 
such that v sub j of v sub k is equal to 1 if k equals j and 0 otherwise. Recall that elements of v prime are linear maps from v to the scalar field f. A linear map is uniquely determined by what it does to the basis vectors. Thus, specifying v sub j of v sub k really does define v sub j. Let's look at an example. Consider the standard basis e1 up to en of fn. For each j, define phi sub j to be the linear functional on fn that just picks out the jth coordinate. That is indeed a linear map from fn to the scalar field, so it's an element of fn prime. Not surprisingly, this gives the dual basis of our standard basis, e1 up to en of fn. Our next result states that the dual basis of a basis is indeed a basis of the dual space. In other words, the terminology dual basis is well justified. Please be sure to read the proof of this result in the book. For each linear map t from v to w, we can define a dual map t prime from the dual of w to the dual of v. Notice that t prime goes in the opposite direction of t, meaning that the domain of t prime is the dual space of w. Here's the definition of t prime. For phi in the dual of w, we define t prime of phi to be phi composed t. Let's make sure this definition makes sense in terms of the kind of objects we're dealing with. We start with phi in the dual of w. That means phi is a linear map from w to the scalar field f. We define t prime of phi to be phi composed t. t maps from v to w, and then phi maps from w to the scalar field. Thus, the composition phi composed t maps from v to the scalar field. In other words, phi composed t is an element of the dual space of v. Thus, we see that t prime of phi is indeed an element of the dual space of v, and t prime is a well-defined linear map from the dual of w to the dual of v. Let's look at an example. Define d on the vector space of polynomials with real coefficients mapping into itself by d of a polynomial equals the derivative of that polynomial. Thus, d prime maps from the dual space of p of r to the dual space of p of r. Let's see what it does. First, suppose phi is a linear functional on p of r defined by phi of p is equal to p evaluated at 3. That is indeed a nice linear functional on p of r. Now, d prime of phi is supposed to be an element of the dual of p of r. In other words, d prime of phi is supposed to be a linear functional. We determine which linear functional it is by seeing what it does as a linear map from p of r into the scalar field. So we look at d prime of phi applied to a polynomial p. By the definition of d prime of phi, that's phi composed d applied to p. And by the definition of composition, that's phi applied to d of p. By the definition of d, that's phi of p prime. And by the definition of phi, which is just evaluate at 3, that gives us p prime of 3. In other words, we have shown that d prime of phi is a linear functional on p of r that takes p to p prime of 3. Let's look at another example. We'll keep d as previously, but now let's choose a different linear functional phi and see if we can determine d prime of phi. We want to define phi, or linear functional phi now by phi of p is the integral from 0 to 1 of p. Again d prime of phi should be a linear functional on p of r. Therefore, we see what it does to a polynomial p. We have d prime of phi applied to p. By the definition of d prime of phi, that's equal to phi composed d applied to p. By the definition of composition, that's phi applied to d of p. By the definition of d, that's phi of p prime. And now by the definition of phi, that's the integral from 0 to 1 of p prime. 
And now by the fundamental theorem of calculus, that's p of 1 minus p of 0. Thus we see the d prime of phi is a linear functional on p of r that takes a polynomial p to the scalar p of 1 minus p of 0. The algebraic properties of dual maps are pretty straightforward. Here they are. First, if S and T are linear maps from V to W, then the dual map of S plus T is the dual map of S plus the dual map of T. Second, if T is a linear map from V to W and lambda is an element of our scalar field F, then the dual map of lambda T is lambda times the dual map of t. For our third and final algebraic property, we need another vector space u. We have a map t from u to v and a map s from v to w. So st is a linear map from u to w. This property states that the dual map of st is the dual map of t times the dual map of s. Make sure you can verify that or look at the details in the book. Notice the different order of s and t on the two sides of this equation. This concludes part one of the video on duality.